Hi, this is Misha, and this video is something we've been putting off for some time, and I've been spending a lot of time researching and uh, have had a lot of help with the folks over at the AK Files, and just really been um, trying to get, get the story straight because there's not a lot of information. This is on the Polish Kalashnikov variants. And this is part one, which will cover the 76239s. Now, I want to give special thanks to, to Chris from Poland, from the AK Files. He's really helped me get some more first-hand information and kind of debunk some commonly held myths here in America. There's frankly a lot of, uh, a lot of erroneous info out there through a few old articles that were written by Americans who probably just didn't speak Polish, and it's a little confusing as you'll see, but I want to give him the thanks. Jay and I both have Polish collections, and neither of us set out to, um, to have them, but the guns are just so nicely made and available, and um, we just we ended up with them. Before we get into the Kalashnikov, though, just go into briefly a bit of history. After World War I, the arms factory at Radom was set up. It was part of uh, war reparations from Germany. And it was set up to make Mauser-type rifles. And they would do several variations. It would continue on through the 1930s. And it's probably the biggest development that most people are aware of is the, the Vis-35, the P-35 pistol. Sometimes just called simply the Radom pistol. This is a very nicely done 9mm gun based on Browning's designs, a few different ones amalgamated together. And we have a video on it, and I'm sure we'll visit it again because it's worth doing. Of course, Germany and the Soviet Union invaded Poland in 1939 from opposite directions, so it was an occupied nation throughout World War II. To Poland's credit, the folks at Radom, along with many, many others, resisted to the best of their ability. But Germany forced manufacturing, and so several Polish guns will have German Waffen amps from World War II. After World War II, the German influence was gone, but the Soviet remained, and thus led to a communist government taking over in Poland after the war. At this time, the Polish military and the Radom factory were reorganized. Braden became essentially Factory 11, Circle 11, often called Luxnik, and it would begin producing more guns for the Polish military. In the beginning, it would produce copies of Soviet designs. For example, we have the WZ-33 Tokarev pistol. There's also the KBK WZ-44 Mosin-Nagant carbine. It's the M44 variant. If you've ever seen a Polish one, and we'll try to throw up a picture, they're very well done from Poland. Very deep blowing, very nice machining. They would also issue the Soviet DP, often called the DP-28, light machine gun, and some of the SVT-40s after World War II. This worked fine for the late 40s, but by the 50s, they were needing new guns, and so the military was looking to rearm. Now, this is just one I brought out because it kind of fits in with the Kalashnikov. This is the Polish PPS-4352. This is a submachine gun. It fires 7.62 Tokarev. And this is an adaptation of the PPS-43. Again, Radom had been producing it as the WZ-43, an exact copy of the Soviet. This one here, they updated somewhat. The front end would be the same. Now, of course, this is a semi-auto, so we have an extension. Normally, the barrel went in here, of course. This has a stamped receiver, double stack, double feed mag. And instead of having a folding stock in the rear, they added this wood stock. This allowed the submachine gun to be used by infantry. Now they still would make the underfolding, or excuse me, top folding version for specialists, recon and whatnot, 
but they wanted to make a fixed stock version for use by infantry, guards, that kind of thing, where, and they were hoping it would give it a longer range, better accuracy. I bring it out because it's interesting. It uses a screw through the side, but it also uses a tang type screw on the top. There's a tang here, and there's a tang on the bottom, so there's three screws holding the stock in, so it's very secure. But that was a Polish adaptation of the Soviet PPS-43, and it received its own year model, which we'll talk about why that's important in a little bit. They would make these for a few years in the 50s. In 1954, the Polish army decided it wanted to replace its older guns, namely the SVT-40s that were there, older Mausers, the Mosin Nagant, and many submachine guns with newer weapons chambered for the new 7.62-39 cartridge, which was becoming very popular. The original idea was to adopt the Russian RPD light machine gun to replace the DP light machine gun, to adopt the SKS to replace Mosin Nagant and SVT rifles, and to adopt the AK Type 3, the one with the milled receiver, to replace many of the submachine guns and some of the carbines in service. They were kind of modeling their infantry on the Russian pattern. The following year, they acquired several hundred AKs from Russia, designating them as the PMK, which basically stands for Kalashnikov Machine Pistol. They also acquired several hundred SKSs, designating them as the KSS, and they tried them out. They issued them to troops, they evaluated them. Thus, in 1956, they kind of changed their mind on what they wanted to do. They dropped the SKS. They, they, they found that the AK could fulfill both roles just as well, was a cost-effective alternative, would save them money by having one gun instead of two, had just about the same range and accuracy, and of course had several benefits over the SKS. Russia resisted this. They wanted Poland to adopt the SKS because they got basically licensing kickbacks and, and things. They enjoyed selling their product lines to, to their client states, which incidentally, incidentally would be called the Warsaw Pact, Warsaw for Warsaw Poland. So that's where the original agreements were signed and whatnot. It took some time, but eventually the SKS was dropped. Poland Radom never manufactured an SKS. They had Russian guns, like this one here, made at the Tula factory. Now this is a slightly later one that would, than what it would have been in Poland. This one was made in 57. Most of the Polish guns would have been in 54. But they would never make their own SKS. Although Radom would refurbish the existing Russian ones and they would sometimes make new furniture for them and some other small parts. But very quickly the KSS was retired to second line and ceremonial use in Poland. So it had a very brief career with only a few hundred there. Certainly well under a thousand. But just thought I'd bring the SKS out to show you. Why not? Now this here is my Russian AK Type 3 build which appears in quite a few videos. This would be very much like what Poland would have acquired from Russia in 1955. Blued receiver, milled, hardwood furniture, wood pistol grip. You will see pictures of soldiers with the slab side mags in Poland. Since Poland does not seem to have manufactured the slab mags ever, they, they must be Russian. Has a 16 and a quarter inch medium heavy profile barrel. Takes a type 1 bayonet. 14 millimeter threads on the muzzle. Typical Kalashnikov, you get the idea. Yeah. Double hook trigger. Sling swivel mounted on the receiver. Ported gas tube, the usual. Again, the first Polish AKs would actually be Russian. 
But this wouldn't last long. 1957, the Radom factory would set up for AK, or as they called it, PMK production with Russian assistance and tooling and of course the blueprints and everything. And by the end of that year, they were producing their first rifles. It does not seem like they made many PMKs in 1957, but they made some. The following year, they worked on producing a version of the AKS, the underfolder, and it was basically called the PMK, Polish word starts with a Z, for underfolding. Sorry, guys. <laughs> it was basically just PMK underfolder is what it was called. The first ones of these would probably be Russian, or at least built from a lot of Russian parts. And then, of course, they would be all Polish. So by 1958, they are producing both the fixed and underfolding milled guns. They would also do some experimenting. They would try out making a longer barrel version with an extended 57 round magazine to be used as a light machine gun. Keep in mind, this was before Russia had adopted the RPK. They would also try mounting scope rails to the receiver for various optics. Early on, it would have been Russian-style PU scopes from basically World War II. So they were experimenting, trying to make their own things. While the Polish experiments with the LMG, the, the squad automatic version of the AK Type 3, didn't go much of anywhere. The one that did was the grenade launcher. This is a version here. As Poland's transitioned over to full domestic production of the Kalashnikov, they also changed its designation. It went from PMK to KBK AK in the late 50s. Now, they, this specialized grenade launching variant was soon adopted as the KBKG for grenade, WZ 1960, or just 60 as it's most often put. This is a standard AK Type 3 in many ways, but it has some adaptations to make it better as a grenade launcher. Obviously, to begin with, we have an ex uh, extended grenade spigot that just screws on to the barrel. It uses the 14 millimeter threads. We have an enlarged detent here to make it easier to get this off. This also comes with a wrench in the pouch. Take, still takes a standard Type 3 bayonet. Has the 16 inch medium heavy profile barrel. We still have the ported gas tube. We have a gas cutoff on the block here for launching grenades. Off, that's gas off, gas on. Standard hand guards. We have a clamp on grenade sight here. This is the early milled version. Just as a side note, in 1970 they would go to a slightly cheaper stamped version that is clipped on, whereas this one actually has a wing nut and screw. We have a leveler here. We also have a lock on the dust cover to keep it from flying off while launching a grenade. Little lock there. Tab just goes up and down manually. And finally we have this rubber boot that just attaches to the stock with these brackets here. There's just little clips. And these would be fitted with short 10 round mags. Now this is not an exact right one. The original 10 rounds would be blocked to only take blanks. This is just a standard magazine, but it gives you an idea of the look. They would use a smaller mag. This also has the Polish pattern of sling. It's a little bit different from the Russian, as you see over there. We have an actual buckle and loop up here. And then we have this cutout buckle here. This is so you can get the sling on and off if this buckle wasn't 
separated here, we wouldn't be able to get the sling on and off. Pretty heavy duty canvasy material. Otherwise, we still have an AK Type 3. We have a milled receiver. Now this is a kit build done by Gordon Tech many years ago. It's on a Bulgarian receiver, so it's a press and pin barrel. The originals would have been a screw in, but otherwise it's authentic. Now, originally these would have blued finishes with the bolt carriers in the white, and they would have hardwood furniture with pistol, hardwood pistol grips. But as these were refurbished in the 1970s, if they needed it, they would give them a new finish if the old one was worn, and it would be a paint finish, which this one has. And if the original hardwood furniture was banged up, they would give them laminate, which this one has here. You can see because it has the reinforcing pins in it. I think the upper might be hardwood still. But yeah, as these would be refurbished, they would have received the slightly newer pattern. Also, they would get the Bakelite pistol grip if they needed it. But wood's neat, so I have a wood on this one. These would be issued with this type of pouch over here. It's, it's a backpack type thing. It holds all the gear for grenade launching. We have a wrench here for taking the device on and off. We have pockets. I just have my Polish Type 1 bayonet stuck in there. Typical Circle 11 Type 1 bayonet. Leather hanger. I have one dummy grenade here. There's many styles they went with this that it could launch. But this is one of them. Boop. I'll do that in a bit. And while this gun was primarily made, at least with the feature of grenade launcher, you could easily use these as a standard infantry gun as well. This just unscrews, maybe. If they fit very tightly, I'll show you why in just a second. And that's also why they issue it with a uh, wrench. There we go. Just unscrews. Similar to the Yugo spigot, but it is different. It fits much tighter. Part of the reason why, we have an interesting barrel here. It has standard threads in the back, but it actually has a tapered muzzle. This is to make a tighter gas seal with the grenade launcher. This rear sight, grenade sight, just unscrews. And of course, this boot just comes off. It also fits pretty tightly. Let's see if I can get it here, guys. There we go. It comes down, and once it's in this position, these just come right out of the brackets. There we go. And you would be good to use this as a standard rifle. They did make, or continue to make, rather, the Polish version, the KBK AK which would be pretty much identical to a late production Russian Type 3. They too would receive the paint finish during refurbishment and the laminated furniture later. And they would continue to manufacture the underfolding version is the KBK AKS. Production of the grenade launcher would begin in 1960, not surprisingly, and they would actually manufacture these through the early 70s. Some sources say until 1974. Hard to say. It could have just been older guns being refurbished, but they were definitely officially in frontline service until 1974. The standard milled AK would be officially pulled out in 1966 with production ending a very short time later. They would do one final version of this called the WZ60-72 and this was a specialized version for paratroopers. 
It would look identical. It would be a grenade launcher, but it would have a quick detaching buttstock. It would look the same. It would be the wood with the brackets, but instead of having the upper tang with one screw and the lower tang with two screws, this lower tang would be shortened, and there would be two holes, well, I mean one on the bottom and one on the top, and two spring-loaded buttons or catches behind them, so you would squeeze to pull the stock off. So they would make a specialized version. Now we know that they made about 5,000 of this model here with the fixed stock, and about 500 of the version with the quick detaching stock. But we really don't know how many mill guns Poland made. There's some numbers out there, but they seem to be erroneous. So I'm not going to even try to guess at this point. It's just too hard to say. 50,000 has been tossed around. Based on what we see, that could very well be maybe a little more. Who knows? But since they only made the standard version for six years, numbers are probably not that high. They did an underfold or two, as I said, but... It um, seems to have been made in smaller numbers. Because in the US we see quite a few of the parts kits for the fixed stop, but very few Polish milled underfolding kits are, have been seen. Now it is true that quite a few of the underfolders did go to the police after they were retired from military service, so some are still being used in Poland. However, during the 60s, a fixed stock gun was generally considered more usable. This was still at a time when a lot of soldiers marched and necessarily didn't use as many mechanized and armored vehicles and troop transports as they do in more recent times. Also, you didn't have as, you know, you didn't have helicopters transporting troops back then like you do more recently. So it stands much to reason that they would make more of the fixed stocks. That was just kind of the, the thing. Polish milled AKs have superbly nicely machined parts, very nice triggers. They're just great guns. And it's interesting that they really geared up their AK Type 3 production at the same time that Russia was uh, switching over to the AKM. <laughs> this is the Century Polish 1960 Sporter. This is a gun built from a Polish KBK AK parts kit. This would be analogous to the uh, the non-grenade rifle launching version. Notice there's no cutoff on the gas block. Still takes a Type 1 bayonet. This one has the earlier hardwood furniture unlike mine. And it still has the bolt group in the white. Now since it's a Sentry put together it's parkerized rather than uh, blued. But the mag in it is one of the Polish blues. They never would do a copy of the Russian slab side. Instead, they would do the, the late AK ribbed pattern, which would be carried over to the AKM. Now, as you see, it doesn't have the cut, I mean, excuse me, the latch here for the dust cover, and it does not have the cutouts in the stock. Some would have a sling swivel on the bottom, but most would still just keep it on the side of the receiver is on a uh, AK Type 3 of Russian. Yeah, and this has the uh, one of the earlier Bakelite type grips that's uh, brown. So that was the milled production. In 1966, the Radom factory, known as Circle 11 at the time, under communist control, would catch up with Russia and they would adopt a version of the AKM and it would very quickly go into large production. You actually see quite a few 1966 dated Polish kits. It was known simply as the KBK AKM. No real year models. It seems that what would happen in Poland if they were just copying a foreign gun they would just kind of either use the foreign name outright or make a Polish version in, in Polish language, but they would not give it a year model designator. However, when they would design a gun themselves or a major variant such as the KBK GWZ 1960, it would get a year model. You see this with a lot of the later guns too, and a lot of the handguns. Now, this wasn't Poland's first attempt at a stamped gun. After the AKM was introduced, 
around 1960, Radom did do a small test batch of two or three guns on a stamped receiver. Now interestingly, these were more Type 1 style receivers, not the more updated AKM. But you know, that was just more of a proof of concept, it didn't go much of anywhere. 1966 though, the AKM was released. And the Polish version is a little different, but it's also quite similar to the Russian. It has the 16 and a quarter inch lighter weight AKM profile barrel. It has 14 by one muzzle threads. The original guns would still be fitted with a muzzle nut. It would have the AKM bayonet lug under the gas block rather than the type one under the front side base. We would go from a ported gas tube to a ported gas block, like an AKM. We would introduce palm swells for the handguards. And we would use an AKM style buttstock with a tang on the top, with two screws in the top and no tang on the bottom. Now, whereas the Russian AKM would use laminate furniture pretty much from the beginning, the Polish AKM would still use hardwood furniture in the beginning. The original pistol grips on the AKMs in Poland would be made of a black synthetic material. It's not true polymer or plastic, it's more of a type of bakelite or fiberglass. They would of course be built on stamped receivers. But on the other hand, Poland would continue to have bluing for the metal parts. They would blue the receiver, the barrel, the dust cover, just like an AK Type 3. Also just like an AK Type 3, they would leave the bolt carrier in the white, which gives a very smooth feel to these early 1966-67 Polish AKMs. They would of course go to the single hook trigger of the Russian AKM. And they would introduce the so-called rate reducer, which in reality was an out-of-battery safety. So the Polish KBK AKM was an interesting mix. It had mostly AKM features, but it still retained a lot of AK Type 3 features, especially in the finishing. I even have to wonder if they were using up some of the old milled parts. But either way, as I said, they went into major production right in 1966, running through the 70s. Around 1969-1970, they would make some changes. They would go from the blued finish to a painted finish, and at the same time, the bolt carrier would start to be painted along with the rest of the metal. It would no longer be in the white. The pistol grips would become a little more red, meaning they probably changed the polymer mix a bit to make it more durable. And they would start to use more and more laminate furniture with reinforcing pins rather than the hardwood. So that would disappear by 1970. It seems like there was a transitional period. Now it's worth noting that older guns that went through the arsenal refurbishment would receive the newer finish and the laminate furniture. Like I said with my um, KBKG, it had been through the refurbishment so I had the later style parts. Thought I would just show you here how to stock out. This is one of the early hardwood AKM stocks. See? And it, attached to it, I've got one of the second generation slings. I really like these slings. They're probably one of my favorite AK slings. It's a wide material, but it's soft and flexible. And instead of a metal clip, we have this loop. So it's similar to the first gen but we have it held on by metal instead of uh, just all leather out here. And we have a solid buckle versus the, uh, the cut buckle, the, the open end type. And this is just a little lighter and more maneuverable sling. They would also start to coat these in an anti-mold uh, treatment, which keeps them very well preserved. In 1972, Radom began manufacturing the KBK AKMS, which as you guessed it, was a copy of the Russian underfolder. 
Now, since this was after 1969, 1970, it's going to have the later painted finish. You don't really find any of the blued underfolders. They're going to have the painted. And obviously it was the same gun as the AKM, except this uh, underfolding stock, which is the pattern that locks on both sides. Now this gun has a Parkerized finish. This is one from Atlantic many years ago, built from a kit with the original barrel. From what I've been able to research, the Radom factory went from bluing to paint. However, around 2005, and running for a couple of years afterwards, many kits, underfolding kits, came in with a Parkerized finish from Poland, so this wasn't something done in the US. It seems like the parkerization was an arsenal refinishing done by the military. So there are three finishes that are correct for Polish guns, although only two were from the factory. So the AKMS would go into production in the early 70s, and they would keep making both the fixed and underfolding versions pretty much throughout the decade. As time would go on, the muzzle nut would be replaced by this typical AKM slant brake. And as many other nations would do, such as Russia, Romania, they would start to introduce more cast parts. The front sight base would be an early contender to go to cast. The sling retainer in the front would be cast eventually. And Poland was one of the nations to go to the cast gas block of the Soviet pattern. Now, Romania uses a cast gas block too, but they went to their own style. This is very close to the Russian pattern. You can see by the unique steps and everything here. Russia would introduce this in the mid-70s. However, Poland would introduce it, some people say 84, 85. This seems a little late. I remember some of those kits coming in with... Uh, 83 and even maybe 82. My memory might be a little foggy there. Data trends. But it seems like by 83 they were using this Russian style cast block. We have of course the laminate handguards. We would also get the lip on the back of the dust cover latch here. Which is a late feature introduced in Russia. The dust cover would change a smidge. The mag catch would also change a little bit, receiving the hump. You see this in East German guns as well as Russian. We have a late style mag here with kind of the matte painted finish. They also have one that's more of a glossy paint. And as I said, the pistol grip would acquire more red, kind of a brownish red. And this would really be the same type of grip used all the way through the tantal. So of course the riveted stock. I have a uh, drop case for the AKMS here, it's Polish style, just typical case, just thought I'd bring it out. I also have a few accessories. We have a Polish bayonet, typical AKM style for the most part, but it has the very nice Polish quality we expect. Very high polished blade, doesn't have the... Uh, teeth on the back as some AKM bayonets do. It does have the insulator and the wire cutter though. Bakelite grip. We have some mag pouches over here. Poland mostly did the three cell, although it would go through some evolutions. The material would change, the belt straps would change a bit over time. This is just three of them I had around. These also hold the cleaning kit. For guns that kept the cleaning kit in their stock, Poland would go to this oiler that could fit in the same compartment. Kind of neat. It's a Polish oiler. They would use these for a long time. I think they still do, honestly. So yeah, just some Polish gear here. Why not? I think it's all neat. This is all, you can usually find this stuff in really good condition and for really good prices right now. This has a third generation type sling. It's more of a traditional AK with a metal hook. 
This one's made out of the softer material. You also find this made out of a darker color and those tend to be a little stiffer. I have one on my tent, which you can see in a different video. So yeah, change the slings up. They went to cast parts to make these a little faster and easier to produce. Now I say they went to cast parts and they did, but this was only for things that did not receive stress. The trunnion was always machined, always forged on these guns. They would never use a cast trunnion in Poland, Russia, or anywhere else in Europe for military production. Yes, I do know before anyone comments, the commercial WBPs when they first came out had cast trunnions, but those were for the US market. For the military production in the 70s and 80s, they were still forged. Now, when did the KBK AKM go out of production? This is a bit of a, I, I never really found an answer. According to Radom, they took it out of main production by 1978. Sometimes they say 76, but you get the idea, late 70s. Now, WBP, on the other hand, says they kept making them all the way through the 80s. I guess it doesn't really matter. I just like to know these things if I can. It's also possible the Polish military simply quit purchasing fixed stock guns in the 70s because most all the kits you see from the Polish military in the 80s are under folders. So it's possible Radom was still making them, but not for the military. It could have been for export or just for because they could. Regardless, underfolders were much more useful by this time. As I said with the mill guns, in the 60s, you still had an infantry that was mostly on foot. By the 70s and 80s, though, we have more and more mechanized units, more and more troop transports, and we're starting to have helicopters that can carry troops. So having an underfolding stock is a large asset. It makes the gun nearly a foot shorter when folded. So by the 80s, this was the model that people preferred, at least in Poland. Now all of these have been in 76239. And when Radom actually quit making the AKMS, it seems to have been around 1995. It seems like they would still do small production batches to replace guns in the military and war police up through the 90s. And the late production guns will be very similar to this, but they'll have black pistol grips. So they were making them after the fall of communism. They also tried to, um, to export them and you know, be commercially viable because of uh, the, the Luxnik factory becoming privatized in 1992. Throughout the 1970s, Radom would continue to tinker. If you noticed before, they liked to tinker like they did with the, um, with the mill guns, trying to make an LMG, trying to make kind of a DMR in the late 50s. Well, after going to the AKM and the AKMS, they would start to develop a grenade launcher. Now, even though the AKM, the stamped gun, had gone into service as early as 1966, they, would, they were continuing to use the older milled guns, the KBKGs, to launch grenades. They did develop the WZ-74 Polad. This was an underbarrel grenade launcher that hooked onto the bayonet lug. When they attach this to an AKM, they would call these WZ, or KBK WZ, I should say, 74 rifles. And this would be why the milled guns, grenade launching guns, would be phased out in 1974. They finally had a grenade launcher they liked for the, uh, for the stamped. Afterwards, they would work on this gun here. Beginning in 1975, they would try to copy emulate the Russian AKML, which was a night fighting gun. Now this gun here is my SAR-1. Sorry guys, I didn't have a uh, Polish gun with a uh, side rail, side scope rail, but it'll work because it's another pretty much exact AKM clone if you can ignore the uh, donkey dong foregrip. <laughs> now they would work on the AKML and they would start to introduce these in the late 70s. It was essentially a kit to convert a standard rifle to be night fighting. We have this very long 
and very effective birdcage flash hider that would be screwed on. It would be carried in this belt pouch and we would have this bipod here that would go in it. This bipod is quite neat. It's very lightweight, very portable. It kind of opens up as you see, collapses in on itself. It clips on to the barrel. You can either clip it up here or back here. I just did it up here because the barrel is a little thinner. It gives reasonable stability. Certainly better than monopod. But of course the biggest element to the system would be the NSP3 night vision system. This is an early generation night vision optic. As you can tell it's not exactly small. It's pretty heavy. <laughs> it's probably a little bulkier than it is heavy but it is very much both. It would mount to the side rail. As would most optics. Of course it's adjustable. It would use a wet cell battery. This is a Pol Polish optic, even though it's on a Romanian gun. <laughs> As is the bipod. I think this is actually a US made copy of the AKML flash adder, but it doesn't matter. And so Radon would start to produce AKMs with the scope rail for this purpose. If they were using them for standard optics, which they also started to do more in the 70s, they would be called the AKMN. And if they were using them for night fighting, they became the AKML. They would also do an underfolding version called the AKMLS. So they were especially working with optics in the 70s. They even were tinkering with a new cartridge, 7.62 by 41, and other programs such as the Lanta. So development definitely was continuing, and as it did, they were trying to get further and further away from just straight up copying Soviet guns and trying to do their own thing, trying to express more independence. Yeah, this night fighting rig is uh, definitely unique. They did not make very many, a few hundred in Poland, but enough for their purposes. Russia would use their version of the AKML quite extensively in the Afghanistan war in the 80s though. So these were combat proven. And as Jay was pointing out before we started this clip, this flash hider is actually highly effective. So even though the scope is an early generation night vision, the bipod and flash hider are quite, uh, quite good and quite effective for what they are. And again, sorry for not having a uh, Polish gun with a scope rail. <laughs> so what about the RPD? At the beginning of the video, I mentioned that in 1954, the Polish army was looking to replace its Russian DP-28 light machine guns with the RPD. Well, it did. It, um, it, it purchased several hundred, just as it did with the AK Type 3 and the SKS. And it tried them out and liked them. It acquired the production rights from Russia in the 50s and would adopt it as the RKMD. That's the local name for the gun in, uh, in Poland. And no, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce those four words. <laughs> but we'll just call it the Polish light machine gun. <laughs> so they would start to produce these in the late 50s and through the 60s. The RPD was designed at the tail end of World War II. It was a belt-fed machine gun, chambered for the then very new 7.62-39 round. It has a heavy but fixed barrel. This is not quick change. We have a tubular bipod. We have a adjustable gas system. We have dual dust covers on each side. We have a non-reciprocating cocking handle that also folds up when not in use, folds down for use. Club foot buttstock, wood grip. In Poland, Radom would make some changes to this, some improvements over the original Soviet design because Russia would get quickly go away from this 
replacing it with this, the RPK in 1959. They would adopt it at the same time as the AKM. They wanted a system where they would have an infantry rifle and a light machine gun that were at least somewhat parts compatible and that would also feed from the same magazines. The RPK feeds from AK pattern mags. They would make an extended 40 rounder for it as well as a 75 round drum. The RPD on the other hand feeds from belts. These are usually 50 round belts and they're housed in this drum which is nothing more than a container. Really this was borrowed from the uh, MG34. It's just a hollow container. Potentially you could link as many belts as you wanted together but this typically holds two belts which is 100 rounds in the drum. This is a Pol uh, Polish sling too. It has It's a lot like the early AK sling in Poland, but it has leather tabs on each end. It also has a large storage compartment in the stock for quite a big cleaning kit. So Russia went to this, but Poland was just ramping up RPD production. So they would manufacture these and use these through the 60s. In the 19, late 60s, early 70s, Poland would acquire a couple of hundred RPKs and RPKS, the folding stock version from Russia. And this is a Russian kit built by Legion USA, so it's Russian parts. They were built at the Molot factory over there. So Poland would acquire a few for evaluation, but in the end decided it did not need the RPK. It did not ever obtain a license to produce it in Poland, and it did not try to reverse engineer it. So there are no true Polish RPKs made there. There's just a few couple of hundred that they purchased from Russia. And by all accounts, they never really put these in the field. They were just for te test and evaluation. They were happy enough with the RPD. And to be fair, they were in a peacetime and the slightly higher manufacturing cost of this gun really probably didn't affect them much. Radom's continuing high quality shows through in these guns. Just the finally, of course, this is a DSA build. This is Jay's. We have a video or two featuring this gun and they're quite fun. Now also this would be an open bolt I forgot to mention whereas the RPK would go to a closed bolt. This uses the Kalashnikov system with the rotating bolt. This uses the Dithyrev system which has the flappers on the bolt. They lock in and out. They're kind of wings on the bolt. So different system, although you can see the layouts are quite similar. The RPK is a few pounds lighter. This is about 15 to 16, and these range from about 10 to 11. So you are saving some weight with this. But, you know, Poland was set up to make these. I bring this up because there were some kit guns built by Century a few years ago that were mislabeled as Polish RPKs. These were not Polish. These were made from... Romanian kits. In fact, Century even called them the M64. Romania calls it the PM64. So they weren't trying to mislabel them. They just got mislabeled on a website or two and that kind of took off. So I just wanted to mention that Poland kept on using the RPD as its light machine gun for, for quite some time, really until it went to, um, to NATO. In fact, more recently, they've kind of introduced a version of the PKM made domestically chambered for 5.56 NATO, which is very interesting, but a topic for another video. This pretty much wraps up the 7.62-39 guns in Poland. We went through the milled AK, the stamped AK. We talked about the SKS, or the KSS, as it's known there. And of course, we're wrapping up with the RPD. So that's about it. This is kind of part one. I'm sure we'll do another part looking at the more modern Polish guns such as the Tantal, the Buriel, and uh, the most recent guns to come out of Poland, the WBP products. If you have any questions or comments, please post them below. If you like the video, really appreciate a click there too. Please share and please subscribe if you have not already. And uh, please tune in again next time for hopefully another interesting video. We'll catch you then.